Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, fantastic. And it's great to see you all here participating in the political process. It's a wonderful thing to see, but that's what we do in San Francisco, isn't it? This evening, you will be hearing from candidates for the District 5 Board of Supervisors. They will have a chance to present their views on issues affecting the city and to answer your questions about those issues. To submit questions for the candidates, look for a volunteer, look for a volunteer, and I can read, who will be handing out index cards. We will collect all questions by 7 p.m. as Ashley indicated. The candidates will answer questions you and the audience submit, as well as questions that have been submitted by the League of Women Voters. The, the timekeepers in the first row will hold up a yellow card to signify to the candidates that they have 15 seconds remaining, and will hold up a red card when it's time to stop. All candidates have agreed to ask their supporters to be respectful of other candidates and the audience and to maintain quiet during the forum. I ask you to respect the commitment. You have many important decisions to make on November 8th. Today's forum will give you an opportunity to be heard. Now, let's begin. We're going to start the questions with Supervisor London Breed. And we'll start off with the one that's on many of your minds probably after hearing how many propositions are on the ballot for this coming November. There are 25 propositions, 24, on the fall ballot. Some say this indicates a failure by the mayor and supervisors to do their jobs. What do you think? Well, I have to agree with that, um, but I want to be clear that not one of those propositions that's on the ballot is something that I took the lead on and put on the ballot other than the police accountability ballot measure. Um, specifically, the police accountability ballot measure will take the Office of Citizens Complaint out of the office of the San Francisco Police Department put it in its own separate department and give it broader independent investigation powers to deal with officer-involved shootings as well as other issues that continue to plague our police department. That's a really important ballot measure, so I hope you'll consider it, as well as Proposition I, the Dignity Fund. That's a really important ballot measure. And Proposition C, which will add almost $250 million of new monies for affordable housing. And so, do you want me to continue or stop or one minute, sorry. Okay, thank you very much, Supervisor. One minute goes fast, so. <laughs> it does. Yeah. Supervisor Breed, um, Mr. Preston. Well, thank you and thanks to everyone who organized uh, this event and for all of you for turning out uh, this evening. Uh, there are too many measures on the ballot. Anyone who's received their handbook, it looks more like the old yellow pages and its main value for some people will be as a doorstop, it's huge. Um, and a lot of those ballot measures should not be on the ballot, should have been resolved at the board, and frankly, some of them, like Proposition Q, which always comes up in an election year, which is the anti-homelessness measure, uh, really shouldn't be there. I do think it's something uh, where the board president, Supervisor Breed is the president of the board, has some control uh, over her colleagues um, and should have made sure that there were fewer measures on the ballot. I am in favor of uh, four measures that would control and limit the mayor's power. I think they're extremely important. I will be voting for all of those, and my understanding is that Supervisor Breed opposes those. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that goes to our next question, and you can continue on with your uh, thoughts on this, because the next question is, there are four ballot measures on the November ballot that are described as a check on the mayor's power. What are your positions on these props and why? I'm 100% supportive of these four measures, and I think that these measures will shape the future of the city. Um, right now, the mayor has too much power, and we're seeing the results of that. Um, I think that the mayor and the moderate supervisors on the board, including Supervisor Breed, have taken us 
down the wrong path uh, in San Francisco. And these measures will dictate uh, what kind of transparency we have at City Hall. I'm particularly interested in the measure about what happens when a supervisor leaves their seat, which is going to happen next year. Right now, the mayor gets to pick that supervisor, and then we're stuck with that pick for years. So essentially, the mayor will get to dictate who controls the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco. I think that's wrong. I think the people deserve to vote in a special election when there's a vacancy. I support that measure uh, and the other three that control the mayor's power. Thank you very much. Supervisor Breed? Is the current system perfect? No. The mayor has had three opportunities to appoint supervisors and two of them lost because I, I know that because I beat one of them. And the fact of the matter is, if the mayor has the ability, to me, this proposition gives the mayor more power than it takes his power away. He will have the opportunity for up to six months to potentially appoint someone his staff member or whomever he wants to do exactly what he wants to do because there's no accountability to any voter. So I don't understand how uh, we would allow something like this to move forward when in fact, as far as I'm concerned, it does add additional layers of power to the mayor. That's one particular issue that I have. And I, again, I say the current system isn't perfect, um, but it's worked in two cases. And I don't support this, not because I support the mayor. I don't support it because I don't think it's fair to also tell someone that they can't run for a seat when they're in the seat. I don't think it's democratic. Thank you very much, Supervisor Breed. Our next question has to do with public transit. And if you're like me, you took a bus or a train over here today. And I'm sure we all had different experiences with that, but the question is, Supervisor Breed, how will you address rush hour overcrowding on the in Judah? And also to go along with that, do you regularly ride public transit? Why or why not? So growing up in this city, I've had no choice but to use our public transportation system for almost 30 years of my life regularly relying on Muni. And more recently, I don't catch Muni as much as I did when I was growing up, but it has gotten better and we, of course, need to improve it more. And what I also notice is that there are so many people in our city who rely on Muni, which is why I led the effort to add four additional trains that basically are used to help alleviate overcrowding in the in Judah. I also sponsored the legislation to replace our entire train fleet. We expect new trains to be coming online next year. We've hired and trained over 700 new Muni drivers. There's been a lot of neglect, unfortunately, with our system, but I've been leading the effort on the Board of Supervisors to increase capacity so we can deal with those particular issues. Thank you very much, Mr. Preston. Uh, thank you for the question. So San Francisco is a world-class city and we deserve a world-class transportation system. Um, I have been an everyday Muni rider for the last 23 years in which I've been living in San Francisco. Um, and I, 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 as with many uh, fellow Muni riders, have been packed onto trains. And when we pack more and more people into the city without adequately planning, we end up with overcrowding that I experience on a daily basis. I want to pass a Muni Riders Bill of Rights, something that has never existed, uh, increase our fleet to prevent overcrowding, um, create new rail and rapid bus lines, and work toward, as the Transit uh, Riders Union recommends, a 30-minute guaranteed trip uh, anywhere in San Francisco. I think it's very important that developers pay their fair share. One of the areas where the supervisor and I disagree uh, are, is around the transit impact development fee. I believe we should require developers to pay for it uh, toward Muni and uh, Supervisor Breed voted against increasing the transit impact development fee depriving Muni of 30 million dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question having also to do with on our streets uh, to Mr. Preston. Drivers are running stop signs in the sunset due to lack of police patrol. How would you improve enforcement and pedestrian safety? It's a huge issue and literally a matter of life and death for pedestrians for, and for bikers. Um, enforcement is key. Uh, this also relates, as I said, to the increased congestion. I mean, trips that used to take 
five, 10 minutes now in San Francisco take a half hour, regardless of how you're doing it, whether you're driving uh, or going by uh, Muni or another form of transportation. Um, so we've got to make sure the streets are safe and enforcement, particularly uh, against violations, uh, speeding, running red lights, um, other uh, dra dangerous driving um, is absolutely where we should start and not going after uh, pedestrians uh, and, and bikers uh, unless they're for violations that endanger the safety of others. Thank you, Supervisor Breed. Thank you, and I want to clear up something that my opponent has said about my support of making developers pay their fair share. Just to be clear, I didn't vote against my own legislation. I was one of the sponsors of that legislation, which for the first time has required developers to pay their fair share, bringing in an additional $20 million for public transit, number one. Number two, what I voted against was an amendment by Supervisor Avalos that was not discussed, that what came in at the 11th hour, and that's, that's what I voted against. The second thing, um, that I want to mention about transportation. I was the deciding vote on Proposition B last year that adds an additional $20, millions to $20 million to public transit. And also, I'm supporting right now our uh, 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 quarter cent increased sales tax that's going to add another $100 million to our transit system. Creative ways, creative solution, adding millions of dollars to our public transit system. Thank you, Supervisor Breed. Um, Thank you very much. But did you address the improvement of safety, enforcement? No. no. Would you like to give me additional time to do that? No, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> but could we address the questions? I understand where you you know what you're saying, but okay. we'd like to get these questions answered for the people who are, who have okay. asked them here. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Okay, the next, the next issue that's really captured the imagination, or should I say what most San, Francisco's talk, San Franciscans talk about is housing. Um, so the next question, and it'll be to you, Supervisor Britt, it'll be, what have you done to expand and protect truly affordable housing for those making between thirty and a hundred thousand dollars a year, specifically those working in our world-class restaurants, our tourism industry, and service industry jobs. So, number one, I was a part of the Proposition C that was just on the ballot measure that was just on the ballot that would add. 25% additional affordable housing requirement on private development, and that 10% of that increase would include people making up to 70, 80, 90 thousand dollars a year. It increases the AMI. We have to make sure, and one of the pushes that I've done, I've had since I've been on the Board of Supervisors, is trying to make sure that we are looking at not just low income housing, market rate housing, what's happening to everybody in between. But secondly, my neighborhood preference legislation makes sure that we give folks who live in our neighborhoods, people who have either been Ellis Act evicted or owner move-in evicted, priority when we build this affordable housing. The problem is in the past, there's been no real linkage between the people who actually need this affordable housing and the affordable housing that we build in the city. And so I've led the effort to make sure that there's a connection between that. Thank you very much. Mr. Preston? Uh, thanks for the question. I we have a crisis, and I'm amazed uh, how unwilling City Hall is to recognize the crisis we are experiencing with unaffordability. And the people you mentioned between uh, 30,000 and 100,000 are the ones being hit with incredible rent increases across the district. People like uh, Kate Lust in the Haight, who just got 175% rent increase and examples of folks who are getting priced out of the city. So what have I done and will I do? Protect rent-controlled housing. It's what I've been doing for the last 16 years, fighting to protect rent-controlled housing. And believe me, real estate developers and real estate speculators who are all too close to our mayor and moderate board allies have their sights on rent control housing and are trying to convert it. So I will continue to fight for rent control housing and make sure that folks have a right to counsel 
so that they can fight to stay in their rent controlled homes. Thank you very much. And Mr. Preston, the next question goes to you also. Airbnb, also another subject in here in the city of San Francisco. A 2015 study indicated that between 32 and 43 percent of vacant rentals in District 5's hate are on Airbnb slash VRBO with commercial listings. How would you crack down on those with multiple commercial listings on Airbnb and VRBO? Yeah, this is part of the housing crisis. It doesn't just come out of nowhere. Airbnb is a huge contributor to the housing crisis. They have converted rent control departments from homes to hotels. They have fueled evictions, and frankly, the city has let it happen. Uh, th this could have been stopped, and it still can be, by standing up to Airbnb. They're making millions of dollars converting homes and changing the character of our neighborhoods. I've been fighting against the, the conversion of rent control departments uh, for, for over 15 years. Um, I, and this is an area where the, the, the supervisor's record is very different than mine would be. She has refused for three years to hold Airbnb accountable, only backed industry-backed regulations, refused to go after Airbnb for back taxes, voted against that. Uh, again and again, the mayor and the moderate supervisors have simply turned the keys to our neighborhoods over to Airbnb. I would go for strict enforcement and ramp up that enforcement immediately Thank to save you. all this housing. Thank you very much. Supervisor Breed. So I believe in effective regulation of this housing platform. And just to be clear, just recently, every member of the Board of Supervisors voted to make sure that platforms like this, when they list anyone, that they must have a registration number. That is a step forward. That is exactly what we need to be doing with this particular platform, is making sure that step by step by step we hold them accountable. And that's exactly what I've been doing on the Board of Supervisors. Thank you very much. And the next question will be um, about our local businesses. There are empty storefronts on Haight and Divisadero streets. How will you support the current local businesses and help them stay open and encourage other local businesses to open? And that would be Supervisor Breed. One of the great things that we've um, recently done at the ballot is pass <coughs> legislation for legacy businesses. Um, passing legislation is one thing, but making sure we provide the funding to um, support those particular businesses another, and that's exactly what we've done with this past year's budget. Uh, the other thing that I was able to do is put money in our budget, $100,000, to work with those particular um, storefronts in order to look at attracting and working with um, companies to uh, rent those uh, areas that where we have uh, high numbers of vacancies. Specifically in the lower height, it's a real challenge, and it's a real challenge, sadly, because Landlords want a lot more than some people can afford. And so Urban Solutions is working with us to try and bridge that gap and develop a relationship to, between businesses who want to occupy those particular spaces and making sure that we can help them negotiate um, those rents so that we can begin to fill those particular storefronts. Thank you very much, Supervisor. Mr. Preston? Well, the contrast between how this city deals with companies, multi-billion dollar companies like Airbnb and small mom and pop uh, businesses could not be more stark. I I'm a former small business owner myself. I was a co-owner of uh, Cafe du Nord, the music venue on Market Street up until uh, 2013. And it's a struggle running a small business in this city. Uh, and small businesses absolutely need help. I, I was one of the leaders in the effort uh, to establish restrictions on chain stores going back more than a decade to make sure that neighbors had a voice when we were moving chain stores uh, into neighborhoods as an effort to protect small businesses from being wiped out by big chains. Uh, and I'm proposing as part of my platform, uh, if I'm elected supervisor, a vacancy tax I believe that the commercial landlords that are hoarding units and getting a tax write-off for the vacancies that are plaguing our neighborhoods should be taxed, and, and that money should go to helping uh, with our critical issues, including our small businesses. Thank you very much. We're going to go on to campaign financing. How would you, uh, Mr. Preston, 
How will you strengthen the campaign finance rules in San Francisco? Well, I'm sorry I only have a minute for this one um, because <laughs> really it's incredible the role that money uh, plays in politics and I'll tell you as a first time candidate running against, uh, frankly, beyond su just Supervisor Brita, a political machine um, in this city. Wow. The, the, the deck is stacked <laughs> when it comes to campaign finance and uh, the loopholes that are exploited uh, in, in order to bring in large donations. We're all limited to $500 donations each toward our campaign, but what happens is there are loopholes. Um, for example, Supervisor Breed ran for the Democratic Central Committee at the same time and was able to take five and $10,000 checks from donors. Uh, I'm, I'm not allowed to do that in running the, the, in for, uh, for this seat. And I wouldn't do that because I think it's wrong. I think it gives too much influence to these large companies. And we need to get serious about campaign finance reform. And I fault not just Supervisor Breed on this, even my allies on the board, folks who are career politicians have not done enough to stand up to the abuse of campaign finance Thank reforms. you. Thank you very much. Supervisor Breed. Thank you. Um, well, there's definitely a lot that we can do. In fact, there's going to be something that we're voting on at the DCCC tonight that would limit or re we're asking the California Democratic Party to look at statewide legislation in order to reduce the dollar amount that any candidate can get for a DCCC race from the unlimited amount it is now to $500. But from my perspective, what I do is I operate within the context of the law. All of this information is public, where my money comes from, wh who's giving it to me, and everything else. It's online if you want to look it up. But that doesn't mean because someone gives you money that you're beholding to that particular person. I mean, if I were wealthy like my opponent, I would use my own money. Uh, but instead, he's choosing to get public financing. And so from my perspective, I'm really proud of my ability to come in and to raise the kind of money I'm able to raise in order to launch an effective campaign. From the projects to the powers, to the powers that be, that's pretty amazing. So thank you for, I mean, I guess a compliment. <laughs> thank you very much, Supervisor Breed. And the next question will also be for you, Supervisor Breed. How will you ensure that open government laws are enforced? For example, making sure that city officials and employees accurately re retain and release their calendars. So this particular thing came up at the Board of Supervisors and you know, I didn't have a problem, I voted against it just to be clear. I didn't have a problem with providing my calendar as it relates to who I'm meeting with, what time I'm meeting with them, the subject matter, and who was in the meeting. What I had a problem with with this particular legislation is my whereabouts and my concern as a single woman who goes to meetings at night and looking at my calendar and establishing a pattern of my whereabouts. And so I provide my calendar under the Sunshine Ordinance or whatever the thing is that we're required to provide our calendar whenever it's requested of me. I have no problem with doing that, but I think it's wrong to try and um, I think it's wrong to force me to provide the locations of wherever I am um, in that particular calendar. So I took issue with that. Thank you very much. Mr. Preston? Yeah, I, I think too much happens in secret at City Hall. I'm a strong proponent of our open government laws. Um, Supervisor Me Breed now provides her calendars because the law passed requiring her to, and it was a 10 to 1 vote at the Board of Supervisors and she was the lone opponent. And while she is entitled to have her concerns about that legislation, the other 10 supervisors thought that it was worthy of passing that law to require folks who are paying the salaries of our supervisors uh, and who our supervisors are representing uh, to know who they're meeting with and when. Uh, that's a basic right, it's a basic uh, for anyone who believes in sunshine and openness in city government, I think that law was a no-brainer. And as I said, it passed 10 to 1. And so all the other supervisors agreed that it is essential to have that level of disclosure. Thank you very much. Um, now, I'm, for clarification, we've heard the terms moderate and progressive used in many elections. And so, and also in a recent column, and this is where this question comes in, a recent column in the Chronicle said Supervisor Breed is a moderate and Mr. 
Preston is a progressive. Do you agree with how you were categorized and why? And we'll start with Mr. Preston. Uh, I agree with that characterization. I've said it on the campaign trail. I am an unapologetic, a proud progressive uh, in the best sense of that word, I hope. And uh, I do believe, uh, I'll let Supervisor Breed speak for herself, but certainly when I look at her voting record on the board and her siding with her moderate colleagues on the board uh, and the mayor in vote after vote, uh, I believe it is accurate to characterize uh, her as a, as a moderate. And, and I think this is a key issue in this election. There are a number of seats that are open. And the future of this board, are we going to have what we had with the mayor and a board moderate majority for three years, which I believe caused a lot of the problems that we have, or are we going to have a board that identifies as progressive and is willing to tackle uh, the issues that matter most to the people in the city? Thank you. Supervisor Bree? So as far as labels, I mean, you know, again, when I ran in 2012, I ran against the mayor's appointee who was a so-called progressive. From my perspective, what I try to do as a legislator is do what I believe is right for the people that I'm here to serve. And so I don't consider myself a progressive or a moderate. I'm not going to put myself in a box. When I first became a member of the Board of Supervisors, I made it clear that I'm going to review every policy, I'm going to make changes if necessary, I'm going to explain my positions, and I'm going to do what I think is best for the people I represent, and I'm not going to X out the conservative people in my district, I'm not going to X out the extremely liberal people in my district, I think it's wrong, I think it does people a disservice, because as someone who grew up in that neighborhood, for many, many years, I felt X'd out by a lot of progressives who neglected public housing, who neglected the African American community, and so it's important as supervisor that I'm inclusive of everyone who I represent. Thank you very much. The next question will go to you, Supervisor Breed. Um, when the subject of increasing theft in the city was discussed at the last debate, according to this card, a young man near me said, get us jobs. What do you plan to do about getting jobs for our underprivileged youth? So what's really great about what we've done, when I first got into office, I made the Western Edition Neighborhood Access Point, which is now called the Success Center, my number one priority because I had so many people. Even before I was on the Board of Supervisors, you know, that was a lot of the work that I did was to help people get employed. And it was definitely really a challenge. We put money into this Western Edition Neighborhood Access Point, which basically is this incredible resource that has provided over hundreds of jobs for young people who didn't know the first thing to do about getting an employment opportunity, whether it's trying to put their resume together, whether they need support or understanding of what it means to show up on time. This center has been, become a great wraparound support system that has provided the kinds of resources, the kinds of comprehensive resources to make sure that young people can get jobs and they can keep them. And on the Board of Supervisors, we ban the box, which is really incredible because what that means are people who may have made a mistake in their life and pay their debt to society can get a second chance. So those are the kinds of things I've been able to do on the Board of Supervisors. Thank you very much. Mr. Preston? Yeah, and we spend a lot of time uh, you know, disagreeing as is the nature of campaigns. I, I think that some of the work Supervisor Breed has done and talked about in terms of job training, in terms of certainly banning the box, we're in agreement um, on that. Uh, I think one aspect of uh, employment issues that tends uh, not to be focused on relates to an earlier question around small businesses. Um, when, whenever employment comes up, it seems like we're always talking about uh, employment at big, either big tech companies or some big companies where really the, the driving engine of so much of where folks can get entry level jobs are often in our small businesses. So some of the issues we're talking about, about supporting small businesses, I think are job creation uh, issues. I would also say that the, the employment and housing issues we discuss are directly linked. And if you get folks jobs but they can't afford to live in the city, at the end of the day, those jobs are not going to last and people are not able to afford to stay in this city right now. Thank you very much. The next question. Some feel there is a disconnect between local government and constituents. What is the most efficient way for District 5 constituents to raise concerns? 
regular town halls, phone calls, emails? How will you increase engagement and responsiveness? And that goes to you, Mr. Preston. Yeah, absolutely regular town halls. And those who have been involved in our campaign know we've done over 50 community meetings and it is at the heart of what this campaign is about. Our, the approach right now all too often from our mayor is to cook up ideas in City Hall and to roll them out in the neighborhoods and then insult anyone who stands up to it by calling them NIMBYs. That's the playbook in San Francisco right now. And we need to flip that script entirely and we need to be planning from the ground up. It's what we did with Affordable Divis, the coalition that responded to Supervisor Breed's decision to rezone Divisadero as a massive a giveaway of density to developers without consulting the neighborhood and we held community meetings in response and pushed that issue. We will continue to have meetings if I'm supervisor. We will have a monthly meeting in different parts of the district throughout my term. Thank you very much. Supervisor Breed. Thank you. Well, actually, um, we did uh, attend several community meetings with the North of Panhandle Neighborhood Association, with the Alamo Square Neighborhood Association. There were meetings that planning information was in my newsletter. Um, we did a lot of outreach. And when I stood and announced the highest affordable housing requirement, for private development in the history of San Francisco, many of those same leaders stood out in front of the Harding Theater with me to make that announcement. So there is communication you know, with my office and the community, and there was in the case of what happened around the rezoning of the Visadero. Um, and so at this point, um, you know, I feel that a lot of the work that I've done is tr to try and be, in terms of communication, be responsive to many of the neighborhood groups by, of course, attending their meetings, announcing their events, holding housing workshops and other things throughout the district. And again, if anyone's interested in getting on my newsletter list, I'm happy to add you as well. All this information is also online on the SFGov website. Thank you very much, Supervisor Breed. As you may guess, there are many questions regarding housing that have come in, and we have another one regarding affordable housing. Um, and we start with Supervisor Breed. What will you do to increase the construction of non-luxury housing in District 5? What is a reasonable percentage of affordable units in any new housing development? So what I'd like to see is I'd like to see us do, of course, 100% affordable housing. I want to make sure that everyone who wants to live here in any income level has an opportunity to live here. The sad reality is market rate housing helps to pay for low income and affordable housing. And so part of what we have to do is make sure that there's a balance. There hasn't been a balance because there's been mostly a push to build really high end housing and really low income housing, leaving everyone else out in between. Not only do we need to make sure that we develop a plan to build more affordable housing, but more affordable housing for middle income residents. And secondly, we also can't forget that we have a lot of low income and affordable housing developments in District 5 that are falling apart, that are in a state of disrepair. We can't neglect those. And so that's what the work that I've been doing since I've been on the Board of Supervisors is making sure we protect those units, we uh, preserve those units, and we do everything we can to rehabilitate those units. Thank you very much. Mr. Preston? Thank you. So we are in an era of what I uh, call a, a trickle-down housing theory. Those of us who lived through uh, the 1980s with Ronald Reagan know uh, what trickle-down theory is all about. This is, what, this is how the mayor and the moderates view housing, is build luxury condominiums and things will trickle down uh, to those who are low income or middle class. Uh, and this is where uh, some of these labels we were talking about earlier matter. The progressive supervisors are standing up to the developers, toe to toe with the developers, saying if you want to build in our neighborhoods and make a fortune off our beautiful communities, you are going to provide more affordable housing, as opposed to the other view, which is just come on in and build it. Right, just come on in and build it. That's what happened with on Divisadero and, and Supervisor Breed's timeline is a little off. She stood with community leaders after we lobbied and fought with her for five months to force her to get more affordability in what she had given away to developers. Thank you very much. And our next question, also going to housing, but for on the 
so on the side of, I guess, of the landlords, the question comes in, some small property owners think renting out a property in San Francisco is risky. How will you encourage rental property owners to keep units on the market? And this goes to Mr. Preston first. Um, so I, I don't think that landlords in this city need any more incentive to rent out empty units than the current market price of a rental unit. So I, you know, I talk to a lot of landlords who I think appreciate how their property has appreciated and appreciate that they are doing quite well, even within the regulatory scheme of San Francisco. Um, but I, I, I don't have a lot of sympathy for landlords that, are, that claim to be holding rental units off the market, frankly contributing to our housing crisis, uh, because they are complaining about the, that they're too burdened uh, by the current system. They, again, they are allowed to charge four, five thousand dollars a month. Their property taxes have not risen accordingly because of Prop 13. Uh, and I simply don't have a lot of sympathy for those that hold rental units off our rental market. Thank you very much. Supervisor Bree. Thank you. Um, as someone who is an actual renter without housing security in a building that just sold with a roommate, you know, I'm really concerned clearly about what's happening all over our city. I know there are a lot of properties that are empty um, and property owners who are saying, I'm just not going to rent in this market. And we're talking about senior citizens who have anxiety, who are uncomfortable, who don't know what to do. And I think that what we need to do as a city is look at how do we work with our senior population to try and, and allow the city to potentially maybe take ownership somehow, rent, to, rent out these properties, and allow them to be somehow used for individuals who need them and take full responsibility of paying the rent. I know there's Section A. I know there's housing subsidies. I know that there's creative ways that we as a city can try and figure out a way to try and get control of these units and work with a property owner who may have anxiety with making this unit available to someone and take that particular um, unit and put it back in the market potentially. Thank you very much. And, and when you were responding, Supervisor Breed, you mentioned Section 8. And this question is, currently all Section 8 recipients are only partially covered under rent control. They have protections for just cause evictions, but not, not price controls. What are your plans to address the evictions and displacement due to rent increases? So that definitely has been um, one of the biggest challenges that we've had um, with people who have come to us um, and, and have just struggled with this particular um, situation. The first thing we try to do is we work with, for example, the Housing Rights Committee and they've been really helpful in facilitating a process and work with the San Francisco Housing Authority to try and get additional support or additional subsidy. In most of the cases that I've personally dealt with, with tenants, they've not been put out. They've accepted the money that they were getting um, through the Section 8 vouchers and they, we, they, weren't able to, they weren't able to force the tenants out. There have been a few instances that we've worked on personally to try and protect tenants, not just in District 5 with uh, Section 8 vouchers, but in other parts of the city. Um, so we want to continue to do that work and make sure that people um, have the resources they need in order to fight with uh, the situation and, and help with the city side of providing additional subsidies if necessary, because we do that now. Thank you very much. Mr. Preston? Thank you. And I have a, a long history of working on Section 8 issues, including at the state level, where we've been pushing against the real estate industry that refuses to ban Section 8 discrimination, uh, unlike in, in uh, Oregon recently, which banned Section 8 discrimination. Uh, California has not. It's a, it's a huge problem. Section 8 is one of the most successful housing programs, despite the federal efforts to keep gutting the funding. Uh, for Section 8. Uh, when it comes to the specific issue raised by the, the question around uh, folks who are fighting against rent increases in Section 8 properties, I think that the best thing we can do to protect those tenants is to pass a robust right to counsel so that the people who are facing those kind of, uh, uh, of evictions, basically, and rent increases that are exploiting a loophole in our local law are represented not just when they go to court, but from the moment they get their eviction notice. We can provide a full right to counsel in San Francisco. It will not cost that much, and it will stop those kind of evictions. Thank you very much, Mr. Preston. The next question, 
What is your position on the proposed grocery tax and how can voters be sure the tax will not spill over to other groceries? Mr. Preston. Yes. Uh, so first of all, congratulations to the uh, uh, beverage industry and their lobbyists for <laughs> rebranding the uh, the grocery uh, the, the 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 soda tax as the grocery tax. Uh, brilliant maneuver, and we'll see uh, if it works. Um, so I I am in favor of the soda tax. I think it is a basic uh, public health issue for me. Um, and that it is important. I view it uh, very similar to uh, like the cigarette tax and other efforts to try to actually uh, influence, uh, to, to provide funding uh, for public health and to go after some of the things that are driving up a, a lot of the costs. I, I, I understand uh, that that's an issue where a lot of people um, of reasonable minds disagree, but that's where I stand. I'm supportive of the uh, subject. Thank you, Supervisor Breed. I, I don't support it. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's it for that one. <laughs> the next question will go to you, Supervisor Breed. What can we do? What have you done? What will you do to promote and encourage women and people of color to be involved in politics and government? Supervisor wow. um, I actually do a lot. Um, there are a lot of um, young women since, you know, I was mentored by a lot of amazing women. My grandmother raised me. Um, Kamala Harris was a great mentor. Gloria R. Davis, the late Gloria R. Davis was a great mentor. I mean, the reason why I'm even here um, as even a supervisor um, for District 5 is because of people like Willie B. Kennedy and, and Doris Ward. They raised me in this community and I'm so grateful for it. And so the work that I've done, I have so many little sisters and young people that I'm really proud of that I've worked with for over 20 years. Many have graduated from college, are working full-time jobs. I mean, I consistently make myself available to them and I spend time with them, and I'm available when they call me or reach out to me. I mean, it is just one of the things that I consistently have done for the majority of my life because I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the folks who raised me. Thank you very much. Mr. Preston? Uh, so I have, in my work and my uh, history, both uh, running uh, Tenants Together, statewide tenant rights organization, uh, and uh, other uh, professional endeavors. I have always uh, recruited uh, and, and mentored um, women of color and, and women. I think it's absolutely essential um, in, in our society. I'm proud to be backing a lot of candidates, uh, women and women of color who are running uh, for, for various offices, including Kim Alvarengo over in D11, uh, Hillary Ronan in, in District 9, Sandy Feuer in District 1. Um, but I will say that it is important, as strong as, as I believe, uh, in, in uh, supporting women and women of color uh, for elective office and other positions. It also matters what their positions are. And the folks who I've endorsed uh, are strong supporters and fighters uh, for working class people in this city and for affordable housing. Uh, and I think that's uh, essential. Okay, we're gonna move to education. And we will start with Mr. Preston. How would you fund, or how do you see funding being made available for programs like universal preschool, and would this be done through a new parcel tax or a sales tax, or neither? If you All right. uh, well, thank you. So, as a, I'm, I'm a parent of uh, two young girls, uh, one in preschool and uh, one in public and elementary school, both here in, in District Five. So, education issues have always been important to me, but have taken an increasingly uh, personal importance uh, to me. I am and, and rolled out as part of my proposal, um, if in office, to uh, move forward uh, with a universal preschool program. New York has done that. I think San Francisco absolutely should do that. We should be guaranteeing four-year-olds uh, four uh, the right uh, to go to preschool and families uh, the ability to actually afford to be in San Francisco without paying a fortune. Uh, just to educate their children. It's also an equity issue because it ensures that everyone starts uh, kindergarten 
uh, with with the same opportunities. I see the stop yeah. sign being held up. I would be happy to talk about funding, but I'm out of time. <laughs> okay, thank you. Supervisor Breed. So I'm really um, proud of the work that's been done already in the city around First Five. I think one of the biggest challenges we have is you know we have great um, robust programs for low income families. Um, the biggest challenge is sometimes connecting those families to those opportunities. That's number one. And then the second issue we have is those families who you know are just right above the threshold and can't qualify, um, which make it difficult uh, for them to access preschool. And so creating um, a fund is something Supervisor uh, Yi has introduced just legislation um, just this past Tuesday um, to create a specific fund that could help support um, funding for preschool um, legislation that I support. Um, he's been an incredible advocate around this particular issue and I've supported him on every step of the way. Thank you very much. Now according to my little list here, this is supposed to be our last question, although I have many more questions here. So I encourage all of you to contact your candidates and contact your supervisors and ask those questions that we didn't get a chance to ask here. But the last one I thought would be, would give us a chance to see what you think about what's coming in the, in the coming years. What is the most difficult decision you will have to make in the next year and what forces will you balance to make that decision? And Supervisor Breed? So let's see, who? I might need a minute to think about that. <laughs> there are so many different difficult decisions that you know I know as supervisor. I mean, every single day, you know, when you make a decision, sometimes from the outside it may seem easy. Oh, you go this way because this is what I believe, or you go that way because that's what this person believes. But these decisions, they have consequences on people's lives. And so making sure that I'm doing everything to weigh both sides and think about the people whose lives I'm going to impact. Um, is really important to me. Um, these have been really challenging decisions, and um, I think um, coming up, you know, what I can't think of anything off the top of my head in terms of what might be difficult, but um, I have really a great uh, housing blueprint that I'm working on that my opponent is definitely waiting for me to release. It'll be released soon that talks about the past, the present, and where do we go from here. The decision is going to be what we prioritize as it relates to developing new affordable housing, whether it's going to be, you know, the new affordable housing, the, um, uh, so that. Finish your thought. <laughs> oh, so whether we're going to look at the new affordable housing and focus on really low income, middle income, what's going to happen with that whether we neglect or continue to neglect um, public and affordable housing. So balancing all those things and making sure with the limited resources we have that we're um, concentrating our efforts on you know, doing those things simultaneously is, is something that's going to be really challenging. Um, and I'm going to continue to push for it. I get criticized for um, pushing to rehabilitate public housing because it's not new developments. Um, but I'm going to continue to, to push that effort along with all the other things that I'm doing on the board. Thank you very much. Mr. Preston? Well, we agree that I am anxiously awaiting the long-promised <laughs> housing blueprint. Uh, we'll see what's in that. I, I think the most difficult decision, quite honestly, is going to be what we move forward with first if I am fortunate enough to be elected supervisor. I, and, and I say that um, I think it will be a difficult decision. We are out on the campaign trail talking to people about the things that are most difficult for them right now. Um, and on day one, and people sometimes talk about their first 100 days or some period of time, what are we going to move forward? I mean, we've identified some things on this campaign, in this campaign that I think are essential. We have to do a right to counsel for tenants. We, we absolutely need to move forward with some kind of vacancy tax to deal with all these commercial vacancies and protect small businesses. We talked about universal preschool, right? The list goes on and the hard decision, and you mentioned the balancing of interests, is what are we moving forward with first? Um, and I will welcome uh, if I'm elected supervisor, the input from folks who have been not only involved with this campaign, but even folks who have been supportive of Supervisor Breed uh, and, and or didn't vote, right, at community meetings and really decide what the community wants to move forward with first. But that's no easy decision. 
and, and we'll have to be realistic about how we phase in what we're doing when to address these critical issues in the city. Thank you very much. Now, we come to the candidates' closing statements. But let me first remind you that if you are not registered to vote, please do so right away and urge others you know to register. The actual deadline is October 24th, and if you've moved, you need to register again at your new address. We will do the closing statements in reverse alphabetical order, and remember, you have two minutes for this. So, <laughs> candidates, Mr. Preston, closing statement. Great, well thank, thank you so much, um, and thank you for taking the time to be here uh, th this evening, and uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think we're facing critical problems in the city, particularly around housing right now, that are not just the result of the natural order of things, they are the result of decisions that have been made at City Hall, and too often the decisions in the last handful of years have been to favor big time developers, multi-billionaires, and folks who have tremendous influence in City Hall. I believe that the mayor has been far too accommodating of those interests, and I believe he has had assistance from the moderates on the board in not standing up to those folks and not standing up for the people who are struggling day in and day out uh, in this city. I am very proud uh, to be endorsed uh, by the San Francisco Tenants Union, uh, by the Sierra Club, the League of Conservation Voters, uh, the California Nurses Association, uh, the Harvey Milk Club, the Latino Democratic Club, Tom Amiano, Matt Gonzalez, David Campos, Eric Marr, John Avalos, Hillary Ronan, Kim Alvarenga, Petra de Jesus, and the reason I mention so many of these folks, and we both have endorsements, right? But it's these, so many of these folks are people who have been fighting the fight that I hope to further and take the torch from them uh, and fight uh, for the progressive values that are so important uh, in this district and for the future of this city. And I believe we're not only have we been going down the wrong path, but we are at a critical juncture where control of the board is at stake and the future of things like rent control, affordable housing, the issues that we care most about here in San Francisco are really at stake in this election. Whatever you do, I just urge you please to vote. Thank you, I'd love to have your support on November 8th. Thank you very much, Supervisor Breed. Thank you, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for this great opportunity. I really appreciate being here. Um, you know, this has been an incredible honor to serve as a member of the Board of Supervisors to represent District 5. And what's so great about that is I know that a lot of the work that I'm doing may not make every resident, every single resident in District 5 happy, but I know that many of the folks in District 5 support me, they reach out to me, I've been a responsive supervisor, and I've tried to make sure that I am closing my ear to advocates and focusing on the district residents who are the people who elected me here as the member of the Board of Supervisors. And so what I hear is what's a big concern, clearly, is housing, is homelessness, is transit, is the environment, all of these things in some way or another, since I've been on the Board of Supervisors, I have been a leader. I have a comprehensive record of delivering so much for District 5, specifically around homeless, 179 empty public housing units that have been rehabilitated because of the work that I've done and 179 formerly homeless families are now housed because of my work. Clean Power SF, have been, people have been working on that for years and I made sure that that was delivered. Working on completely replacing all of our bus and train fleet from Muni and hiring over 700 new Muni drivers. My push continued to make sure we're getting the resources we need. I took the ambulance crises head on and now the response times are a lot quicker than they have been in the past. And on the employment, I made sure that we had the right kind of center to work with many of the folks in our community who have consistently been turned away for employment opportunities. Not with just big businesses, but with small businesses in our neighborhood like Black Bark. 
I understand that there are, am I to stop? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just getting started. But thank you. <laughs> but thank you, um, and I would appreciate your support on November 8th. Thank you. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, please give them a great round of applause. It takes a whole lot to stand up here, I can tell you. <laughs> And answer questions, and answer questions from you, their constituents or prospective constituents. So you all did a great job too for being here. So we thank you. Now for my closing statement. So don't run off. <laughs> On behalf of myself, the League of Women Voters, and our partner organization, our thanks to the candidates for participating, and thanks to all of you again. Thanks to each of you again and again for taking time to inform yourself about your choices on November 8th. Ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.